I wanted to um, recap all the information and try and get through it and not dilly dally on it. So um, I'm just going to get headlong, headlong into it. Now it's going to be about the Bulla Bulla, aka Nightcap Cap community and the people's involvement with it that I've already previously talked about and the structure of it and how um, I've basically done a little bit of a PowerPoint to, tr uh, to try and get through um, just one section because what you have to understand is that a community is made up of members and each mem member can set up its own like little pyramid of businesses to funnel back into the community but the community itself is one larger aspect so that it all funnels through now they, they all seem to have a fairly similar setup so I wanted to establish here that nightcap and bulla bulla are commonly referred to in this PDF document on the right here this is the document that came through from the develop, uh, the realtor, Rich Moat, uh, when I asked questions about being a potential buyer into the Nightcap community. These are part of the documents that he sent in return. So the Nightcap and Bulla Bulla community are synonymous with each other. And also synonymous with the Bulla Bulla community is also the Mount Eco, uh, Mount Warning Eco Village Proprietary Limited which was the public face of it as well as Wollumbin Horizons. Now they originally called it um, Mark Darwin in on the left here in his Bulla Bulla legal structure mentions how they were looking at changing it to Wollumbin Horizons and it was Wollumbin dream time or dreaming or something like that and that he wanted to um, they were thinking about changing it and that was because it was starting to fall apart so I just wanted to show you this briefly because the um, nightcap development that they talk about today has been in the development for the last four and a half years which is encompassing the Mark Darwin um, well he ran off to the UK and uh, Gillian Norman lawsuit and all of these other things so Mark Darwin stepped down as a public front and someone else came to the front they closed down certain businesses and changed certain names. In fact, uh, the Mount Warning Eco Village Proprietary Limited then went on to become Nightcap Village Proprietary Limited. Uh, these are all searchable and I will show you a little bit later on. But I just wanted to point out to you that because of the structure that it's set up, Back uh, then, when they were talking about the Bulla Bulla community, you, you could call it the Bulla Bulla community, you could call it the Mount Eco Warning System, because these were all names synonymous with the same thing. However, Julia Norman couldn't also co prove connections with the Wollumbin Horizons, even though it's stated in this uh, video here um, by Mark Darwin, over here on the left, the Bulla Bulla legal structure, he clearly identifies that it is associated with the setup. But an, an interesting thing, because before I'd only done a cursory look at all of them involved, now I've started to go and look more at the details. So I'll just bring up some more. So when I'm talking about Nightcap or Bulla Bulla, we are talking about the same essentially group of members except that what is presented at the public face has slightly changed because of what happened with the court case and with Mark Darwin. His truthology movement fell out and he, there was some, I don't know, some accusations made against him in that too. And, um, well, his freedom summits, 
They were big in 2014 when both Max Egan and Gunham, um, Buddy Jakamara, were doing their talk. Uh, Gunham was doing it on sovereignty, which he is always doing it on sovereignty and reclaiming um, tribal land and ownership. So um, I'll just pause that and bring up the next part. So I'd mentioned before that I had put in an inquiry. So here in my first email, I sent through and she responded with that part there. And as you can see, the pr starting price is 285000 with a $10,000 discount if you settle within 30 days. Now over here, it's interesting to note that post DA, which I'm saying, thinking is <laughs> development approval. So um, after it's been approved for development, the pricing will start at a minimum of three hundred and forty-five thousand to f and go up to four hundred and fifty thousand. So that's a pretty big pay hike. But already, as you can see, inundated with inquiries and deluge of inquiries, they're getting a very big response because of the videos that Max did with Gunham. So Max has been very successful in his promotional campaign for the Nightcap Village. And one could call that actually a biased conflict of interests because um, as I've mentioned about the finders fee you have to consider that there is a finders fee involved because how the hell does busted ass broke Max afford $285,000 to become a valued member highly valued member of the community now and will be producing his shows and content from the farm more and more now. How does he come up with that $285,000 if not as remuneration in finders fees for the amount of people that he's just brought in to buy into the community? In this email, they've pretty much confirmed that Max has bought in enough to get his price of 285 and Or are we going to suggest that um, the Nightcap the, uh, Venture Enterprises, the corporate structure, the businesses and all of them are just going to give away that valuable land because he's Max Egan? I don't think so. Everyone has to pay to live in that community. Now Gunham did say back in, was it, uh, yeah, August I think, there were 28 properties already there that were rented out. And I don't know what business is claiming that they're receiving rent you know, like everybody else has to do in the real world. But ultimately, they're receiving rent on land that would go straight into the community funding, which is behind a discretionary trust or an incorporated association, so that no one will be any otherwise about any monies received for rent. And the thing is that... Um, this is assuming that there is actually no one renting out those properties that are actually claiming rent assistance from the government on their Centrelink benefits because uh, that could be a little bit of a fly in the ointment. But I don't think so because um, let's take it on to the next thing which is the, um, the questionnaire that you need to return by email before you go there and have your extensive five hour interview. Yes, so I've uploaded all of these documents and I'll leave a link um, to archive or you can look at them yourself. 
So as you can see, the very first thing, they want to know who you are, where you live, contact details, and are you a system trained professional and what is your current profession? Now, you see, the thing is that a community is only as valuable as its working members. So if you have members that aren't working and contributing, you are considered probably not as valuable as somebody that would be contributing not only to the community, but to the profitability and image of the community. I mean, if you think that you can just buy your well you're not buying land you're buying into the community to have what you think is private use of 2.75 acres or whatever it was and um, they're going to ask you questions if this is your private use yes you can still be part of a larger community but are there some questions that are going a little bit too far in really is it any of your business if I am doing it in my own home, my own business? Like I had someone comment to me, I'll just go past this gut ownership one, down to the vegan one. I had someone comment to me, um, I'm assuming they were getting at the point that they may have gone to the nightcap community and they put out both vegan and um, ordinary food so you know I didn't know what I was talking about and I thought well you know you didn't even say that that's where you went so I've got to actually assume that that's where you meant but even if that was the case to put out vegan and ordinary food I mean so what I mean seriously a lot of vegans are actually very easily malleable they have a certain particular mindset that they follow and if you know that mindset they are easy to lead and they also good to put out on the public front uh, of the business the public face so it looks like the community is forward and progressive so you can then pick and choose like you put out food uh, you get a group of people come in and you put out food and you watch what people eat you know a lot about them to begin with you know so and ultimately my experience with vegans is that um, <laughs> they have actually been told by the doctor for crying out loud just go and have a meat meal because the supplements that you're doing are not you know you've become anemic you're very run down and you can't build your system back up on what you're doing all these alternative methods are not working and even if you supplemented them by going and buying you know herbal supplements you know so these uh, couple of vegans begrudgingly did it and they felt better for it and I don't think they went back to it because it is an ideal we have omnivore teeth you know we are designed to eat both and the choice should be it shouldn't even really be a question but here it is on the questionnaire and so this person said that what I said about food prejudices and uh, food choices how it was rubbish the fact that it's on this questionnaire is actually proving me right because you're getting your private land. You've paid all this money, $285,000 to get into it. This is your home, your little hideaway, and you get your peace and your privacy. And it matters what you eat in your own home? No. Because your attitude towards food is going to tell them a lot about who you are. Now, interestingly enough, in Max Egan's latest upload on um, mass manipulation, he brought up guns. And it's like, yeah, I know you boys down there have been talking about guns, haven't you? Because I know that you've got a shit ton of them. And he confirmed what I've said is that Australians are not unarmed. <laughs> they just, you know, it's like people, I know a lot of people outside of Australia think, yeah, we're cool, laid back and all of that. But, you know, what's there's a serious side to it too, you know, like um, 
most farms, all my relatives on the farms, would still have um, rifles and, and firearms because they need it in case they end up with um, Tassie devils coming into the chickens and or, you know attacking things or they need to put down a cow or something like that. I saw that one year where one got bogged in the mud. They couldn't get the cow out and it was already, um, it was past saving. And so, yeah, the, so gun ownership in rural properties is is kind of um, a given. It's not actually a question that I would even ask anyone because I would accept uh, that there is the circumstance. Like, you know, if I had owned a gun, when I had, um, I'd hit a, a wallaby with my ute and it, my bull bars cleaned it up and it wasn't dead and I was on the side of the road I was crying because I was watching this animal suffer and I couldn't put it out of its misery and I wished that I had the courage to actually put it out of its misery but I couldn't so I do understand there's a place for them and a need especially in rural places but um, that is, you know, I mean, all bring all it did when they introduced the new gun laws. I remember I was still living in Queensland. I just had my first son, and it had come in after the Port Arthur incident, twenty eighth of April, nineteen ninety six. I mean, you know, that's kind of well. I hadn't had my first son. I was pregnant at the time, but my son was born in 1996. So I was actually pregnant at the time. And 28th of April is my stepfather's birthday. And my mum and my stepfather had just been down to New Bina that day and played tennis. And they were going to go over to Port Arthur to the um, Broad Af Arrow Cafe and uh, for Lionel's birthday or perhaps down to the Port Arthur pub and have a counter mill there. But, you know, they were tired after their um, game, so uh, they decided that they'd just head straight back out the other way rather than doing the loop back round. It's a big loop if you go down to... You don't turn off to Port Arthur. You'll end up going to New Bina and coming back out at Tirana. So it does a big loop. So the day that Mum was coming out of Port Arthur, well, New Bina, at the Tirana turn-off, she had actually noticed the cops going through and she had wondered what was going on. So, because when she got home, that's when it was all starting to unfold about what had, what had gone on down there. And when she told me on the phone, it was like, wow, Mum could have been one of those people, you know, um... I'm so glad they wore themselves out playing tennis that day and they wanted to go straight home because it's a it's a good drive from Port Arthur back to Hobart, um, especially the way my stepfather drives. <laughs> he drives at about 20k an hour and then it'd take half the night. But anyway, that's a different story. So anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. But the... Um, all it did when that incident at Port Arthur happened was push gunner ownership under the table into the illegal market. I mean, any time they've created prohibition, it's created an illegal market. And thereby, uh, it actually puts it more into the hands of places, you know, that should be fighting crime, but are instead supporting and feeding it. Like the stories that I've heard Brendan O'Connell talk about, you know, I've always wondered when they do a big drug bust, and it's like, what happens to the evidence? Like, they say they destroy it, and it's like, yeah, I'm sure you do. Well, Brendan O'Connell said that he knows in WA that, no, they control the trade. It goes straight out the door, back onto the streets again. So, you know... As soon as you create illegal um, ownership or something or restrictions or prohibition, you push it into a market that then becomes 
also controlled by corruption within the law enforcement agencies. And if this wasn't so classic or typical, look at Al Capone and the corruption within the legal, um, the whole legal system. And the only way they brought him down was tax evasion. Now, isn't that an irony? That's an irony that the nightcap community should actually take a, you know, take a leaf out of Capone's book. They couldn't bring you down on anything else. But I tell you what, you try and avoid paying taxes. Yeah. So anyway, the, the questionnaire here, asking certain questions. I mean, you are going to live, yes, uh, you are going to live in a broader community where you will know people, but you're going to a five-hour interview. Can't they ask these kind of things before, uh, you know, when you get there? If they need to ask them at all. Because really, the level of participation that you want to have in the community is not something that's going to be 24-7. I mean, what does it matter if I'm vegan, vegetarian or omnivore? I'm not going to go and eat with the community. Maybe, you know, if there was a community event where they had a good band come in, yeah. But I tell you what, the bands I've heard in that area, they're dubstep crap. Nuh-uh. I'd need to take earplugs and, well, no, I wouldn't go. It's just, it's crap music. It's not what I consider crap. But then again, some of the music I've also heard coming out of the, I um, <laughs> can't remember the name of it, it's some spaceship or starship that was in Chowan Creek Road that was also associated with the uh, Ganyawe community. Oh, and speaking of the Ganyawe community, I'll just pause and bring up something. It's my buddy, Alan Homer. He sent me a message three days ago, and I responded, you know, probably I, when I saw it, it was probably an hour later, and I'm still waiting for him to get back to me. And uh, do you know how many Alan Hamers there are on Facebook? Oh, let me show you what he... Like he thinks I'm talking about him. It is the same guy. So I called him out and said, yeah, I would like to, to talk. Let's do it. Um, it's on my video. You can read that. It's on that one. I don't have to describe it. What I just did notice in bringing that up, though, this one here, uh, YouTube originally blocked it because of the Star Wars clips that they had in there I was going to edit them out but um, they blocked it because of it so I got them to edit it out and it well it looks like it's come back up and people can watch it now so that's good but anyway I didn't want to make this a really long video and I've yet yeah, got sidetracked again just let me bring up uh... right so this is the setup for uh, the Bulla Bulla village community trust and as as i showed you earlier bulla bulla uh nightcap same difference wollumburn horizons here they didn't name the incorporated non-profit association uh i did have a look at a few things but it doesn't matter now because all these connections have been deregistered and gone into liquidation uh, yes, Wollumbin Horizons, well, I'll get into that in a little bit, because um, I wanted to do a proper slideshow, but I'm just doing a brief introduction here. This is what was presented by Adrian Brennock, the current developer of Nightcap, and uh, Mark Darwin at the Freedom Summits, and this came from the video upload of recreating the um, village and I will upload that as a separate video because I keep saying I'm going to add it to the end and I yak too long and it takes too long to add it on or I can't add it on because of frame rates and all these other different issues so um, I'll just upload it separately and it's a two-hour video that was reduced down to about uh, 
24 minutes, I think, where they really discuss the setup, how it's deliberately set up and how you need to know this setup so that when you go to your lawyer or accountant and get it checked out that they don't think it's a scam or anything that they'll go, oh, I understand and they'll go, yeah, it's all right. So basically you need to explain to them why it's not shonky so that they'll understand that it's not shonky so that they'll go, yeah, yeah, it's all right. But anyway, you can, you can hear them present that in their video. Um, now I did do these slides down the side here. These ones here represent the different properties where I've done basic searches on them and I've actually found out linking dates uh, like you can see where one closed down on one date and the identical date something else opened up and even how um, two of them uh, are lodging documents and doing everything at the same time because they're all trying to move everything into this one place under the whole nightcap village enterprise movement that funnels back to the uh, Mingimble Trust which um, I tried to start it off because you know they had it looking a bit like this picture and it's like no that's I'm sorry that's not the way I see it because each member can have its own little pyramid of triad um, business name, uh, associated trust that can then funnel back through to the main community, uh, incorporated associations and trust where everything is being non-recorded by uh, the official system. So that chart they presented was absolutely stupid because the way I see it more is that at the top you've got the all controlling power, the member, the members of the community that are part of the discretionary investment fund. Now when you buy in and you get your land you are issued a certificate as a member of that trust. Now with that certificate comes automatic uh, membership into the incorporated association whoops, which deals with the public face assets and funnels money through and back. The incorporated association is anonym anonymous members and the members of the discretionary investment discretionary or investment trust are anonymous members as well. So what you see on the public on the front and anything, the only thing that can be held accountable is this company. But when you trace it back, it's untraceable to anyone. And in this Recreating the Village, they actually describe how they've set it up deliberately in this manner so that there is no legal, legal or financial repercussion in the system that they are trying to get out of and essentially setting up a tax avoidance system. And I don't care if anyone wants to bitch to me and leave me comments about how, you know, there are millions of hardworking tax paying citizens in this country that can't afford to pay taxes and are. And you're still milking a system that they're paying into. You're getting benefits and you're not putting anything into it. You're funneling it into these places. Now if you are in the nightcap community and you are not renting, then the person that you are renting from is the member of the, the community. And as a member of the community, you must thereby be a member of the discretionary or investment trust, the incorporated association, and linked to the public company. Because the way it happens is that the members give instructions to the incorporated association and the incorporated association tells the company what to do on the outside face. It comes back to the incorporated in, in association to receive instructions 
on what to do and how to act. So basically the incorporated association is the company's boss and the members in the community are the boss of the incorporated association. So being a member of the community by the very nature of the setup makes you a, a member of each component. Now the reason that um, I haven't got too much into it is because there are, let me bring up the PDF, four owners that have come into this, which is three companies and three individuals, which actually can trace back to proprietary limited companies and trusts as well. So each one of them has got their own little pyramid set up where they are the member and they're acting out in this public face to buy and draw themselves into the community where they can funnel it more again. Now while I've brought up the fact here of Wollumbin Horizons I just want to show you that see this this was documentation sent through to me as a prospective buyer saying that as part of the overall project Wollumbin Horizons is the owner of 32222 Kyogle Road and 3234 Kyogle Road. Now the first one, 3222, was just recently in June 2020, as Mark McMurtry said, reacquired in June this year. Now, it was put up for auction by Ray White as a receiver's auction. Now, it's like, okay, so it's a receiver's auction. Who was in receivership for it to go into auction to reclaim this property back to pay the creditors back? Because... Wollumbin Horizons is actually under receivership in, and is being liquidated and this happened back in 2018 and I'll show you that very shortly. So this Wollumbin Horizons that uh, is also associated with the Bulla Bulla um, through Mark Darwin's video on the Bulla Bulla legal, legal structure, he talks about Wollumbin Horizons and draws all of these business names in together and says they are all one. So as I'm saying, all of this is coming out of their mouth and I guarantee you this stuff wasn't presented in court either. So this Wollumbin Horizons, now you have to understand that each one of these owners can have their own pyramid of how they've set up to deal with becoming a member of the community itself which is overall a larger investment because it offers business return profits as well because of all the other businesses that it owns already the Sphinx Rock Cafe, the Caravan Park, the General Store um, and the other two s stores the Fruit and Veg and the one that's that's not least well according to Google Maps anyway there's also the apparent hemp farm and clearly there's the um, misty mountains and tourist accommodation and all of these things. So all of these business activities are getting funneled through these um, light grey areas here where you can't come back and say that anybody was receiving anything. Prove it. So each person needs to be looked at as their own little pyramid because there are different ways that they can interface within the public structure and also within the nightcap structure. Now this one here, we've already found out that Wollumbin Horizons, Bulla Bulla, Wollumbin Dreamtime, which is actually deregistered, um, is uh, it went into receivership voluntary winding up on the 14th of August 2018 now 
if Wollumbin, if see, this is where I'm confused about who actually owned three triple two Kyogle Road because um, if the auction was a receiver's auction, what business owned it to be in receivership? Was it Wollumbin Horizons? And if it was, well, he just bought it back under the banner of Wollumbin Horizons. And as, and I'm not going to say it, I'm going to let Richard Mote say it. More about Gunham's Land, Nightcap on Mingible. Three triple two is what he just purchased. But he didn't say he just purchased. His words reacquired. So how had he previously acquired it to be in the knowing of actually coming out with reacquiring? Because there was some falling out to do with everything that folded up. Now I'm going to take you on to this next little one here because this is kind of the current overall setup to manage the whole overall setup but it does break down into member components that each one comes in to the to this will add its own little pyramid and they've all got their public face and what they hide behind so this next slide now here as I've said that um, these two associations to do with uh, Wollumbin Horizons it went into voluntary wind up August 2018 now the Bulla Bulla community was deregistered on 10th of November 2017 and the associated incorporation which is this thing here was also deregistered but not until last year until they had reformatted the um, other discretionary um, member tie-in with the incorporated association now um, that isn't quite accurate there in this respect where it is the incorporated association it's an unincorporated association there is um, other tie-ins to this that I need to but that's a little bit more in depth so the Bulla Bulla and Nightcap community are the same so is Bulla Bulla and the Mount Eco Village if you notice here, if you look up Nightcap, actually if you go to look up for Mount Warning Eco Village, it comes up with this company registration because up until the 10th of November 2017, does that look familiar? Dates tie in. Actions made by people tie in together in the community especially someone who is behind the whole nightcap village enterprise and the main instigator and according to uh, the nightcap village community the most thanks that Adrian Brennock gives is to Gunham and Max Egan so I wonder what Max Egan bought in I mean it's not like he invested in it and again, I ask the question, where did he come up from with the money for that? So the Nightcap Village is the Mount Warning Eco Village. The Mount Warning Eco Village is also Wollumbin Horizons and Bulla Bulla. They are all the same thing. Now, Gillian Norman couldn't actually prove this in court. Uh, but since then, there have been um, YouTubes go up that I actually found with this structure that enables you to follow and find out. Now I'd got it this far yesterday 
and I thought all right what do I do with it now because really now what I need to do is look at the paper searches and that means forking over money there's so many different searches to do and it was by sheer coincidence that I happened across my cousin in Victoria and I looked him up and he was he's now a senior investigator with ATSIC and so I uh, went to his Facebook profile I mean I haven't talked to him in years I don't even know how often he checks his email if he I mean his Facebook if he even uses it he could just be like me and um, asking him pretty much you know what to do with this information that I've now got because I've taken it I've, I've started to bring everything together so that it can be tied together that the associations that couldn't be made by Gillian Norman can now be made and provable to the court rather than the court turning around and saying well you know it's not you haven't proved it that these people are associated together so um, my cousin he um, used to be a cop in Victoria then he went on to law school and I think he became our equivalent of you know like the DA and um, when I looked him up so I was completely shocked to see that he's actually a senior ATSIC um, investigator so yeah send him a message and hopefully I might hear back from him and with any luck he might be able to um, take the information and go with it because um, Max Egan is now a member of the community. We know anyone that knows Max Egan says he's got no money, he's broke. He lives on people's donations. He doesn't get any government handouts, so he lives on people's handouts, on what other people give him. So where does he get money to become a valuable member? And as I said, seriously, are we going to expect, are we, that Max Egan is that valuable that they're going to give away $285,000 worth or potentially $450,000 worth? No, Max has earned his way into the community with the finder's fee. And just let me bring up the finder's fee in the court documents, just in case you didn't catch that last time. Now this um, finder's fee was actually also has come in when it comes to Rothwell Wall and his breach of fiduciary trust, which Gillian Norman is now taking to the High Court. Uh, to bring in both matters to be heard together because they were being heard separately and now they're going to be heard together so that this um, previous issue that uh, was ruled upon is going to be taken to the High Court along with a fiduciary trust breach by the solicitor or lawyer taking in the money. Now Mark Darwin, as I introduce Mark Darwin, is one of the plaintiffs along with, um, comes in further down the mount, uh, further in the uh, documentation, the um, Mount Eco Village buys in as a party to this. So these people that are party to the um, law case are declaring that they were involved with it. Now this same guy here is still at the front, front face of promotion and developing of the community. Um, it's no longer Mark Jam James Darwin. He was pretty much a no-show in court and so was Stephen Peter McQueen. They both withdrew. It was only these two here that ended up with uh, following through. The others couldn't be bothered. 
and they all dropped their c case against the Nimbin School Co-op. Yeah, I could understand that. You're picking on a school newspaper? Yeah, you know, come on. They don't have anything. <laughs> and the co-ops the co in Nimbin are community driven. So if you're suing a co-op, you're suing a larger community that is only trying to represent freedom of expression of people's opinions. And if you've got nothing to hide. But then again, people that do have something to hide spend more money trying to shut people up, as Gillian found out. So um, I've shown you about the finder's fee, the parties involved, and uh, some members are going to remain in the background. Well, I, don't, I couldn't tell you how many members are actually there. If there's 28 been places being rented out, that is highly possible that they were rented out to members until such time as they could be given their certificate. I don't know. Gunham seems to say, you know, look, you know, we can kick out those renters at any time. You know, there's 28 places there to pick from. So I kind of figure that they're not involved with the community, that they are just people that have been bringing in an income um, behind closed doors to help, you know, get them to that stage of paying two million dollars to reacquire uh, the the three triple two Kyogre Road. So it's all coming together as far as bringing the names and everything but now I wouldn't mind it if my cousin helped me to um, perhaps use a bit of his um, influence to do some corporate searching and find out you know what he can if I give him the basic structure of how it works as I can tell you that people are going to get hurt they're going to get ripped off and if Max Egan is talking about guns in his latest video trust me it's been talked about in the community and they are preparing because Gunham knows he's got a target on his back because of how much he has pushed sovereignty in the government's face, in the courts, not only in Australia, but in the UK as well. So, you know, he's a pretty big known personality, Mark McMurtry. He is not someone that the government are going to go, well, let's not worry about what he's doing. So, in Max Egan saying that about guns, when he hasn't mentioned anything about that at all before, means that he's heard it brought up and talked about and whereby the community is preparing for the scenario what if and that way you should be preparing for what if you are there and you have bought into this this is why they ask you how do you feel about guns because they anticipate that once they have this locked community in place that um, it will be sovereign land that the police cannot legally enter on and they have no legal authority on and they are in that respect preparing for the standoff even though they know that if that comes as Max Egan says what hope have they got against semi-automatic weapons well, that's the thing. All the illegal gun trade, do you think it's in <laughs> ordinary weapons or do you think that it is in semi-automatic weapons? Let me tell you a story about how I came across a semi-automatic weapon. I got woken up one night in a tent by someone that had come in I won't say the sacred land I was staying on at the time and disrespect the elders there of the land. The ancestors, not the custodian, who used it more as a tip. I'm in my tent. This um, one comes in, he's doing a runner from the cops. He knows that they can't come on the land. And he's waking up one of his other mates because uh, he needs to hide. <laughs> He called it an AK-47 and uh, 
I could hear all the talk going on outside the tent. I could hear the different rattlings and cocking of the guns and stuff like that. I mean, whatever it was, it was a weapon. Whether it was what he said it was, I mean, you know, seriously, the only AK-47s I know of are in games. Even though I know that they're based on a real weapon, it's like a... But this guy, apparently, uh, yes, he's got a pretty bad reputation with the uh, Lismore police, and they're constantly after him, and he's on the run, and yes, he does have semi-automatic weapons. So the illegal trade in semi-automatic weapons is as paramount as any other type of weapon. So if anyone was actually thinking, oh, well, you know, it won't end up in a in a firefight because they accept that they can't fight semi-automatic weapons. No. The tribals are armed with semi-automatic weapons already. You know, from my experience, of course not all of them are. <laughs> I mean, seriously, nobody's, not all people are armed either. So this is not a generalised, it, it's not a specific, uh, oh, well, generalisation specific. This is just an experience I had to let me know that, yes, there is most definitely semi-automatic weapons out there. There is definitely the capacity. Now, where did they come across? Um, I know another guy who went into Lismore and I heard him talking about how he'd broken into storage sheds and he'd found the mother load of uh, guns in there and other things. I mean, the thing is that some of them are constantly going through other people's things. That's another thing that you have to remember going onto tribal land. You could wake up on your 2.75 acres and think that you've got privacy and find that tribal members just wander in and do what they want. It's their land. They own it. And you're there by their grace. And if you don't like it, well, get kicked off, lose your money, and um, <laughs> have no leg to stand on in court. Like it or lump it. As again, I say it's not all, but I tell you what, it's a lot. And when this whole community comes back to the Minjimbo, let me just bring that up. So this is the trustee for the Minjimbo Tribal Discretionary. 21st of November 2019 so just last year started up and that was before the final 3222 Kyogle Road was reacquired for two million dollars after Ray White sold it at a receivers auction and know this it was all public information receivers auction what, who was the receiver? Don't know. So this is the MT discretionary that's associated with it. So the whole, anybody investing into the community and in everything in it, it comes back to only two named representatives at the front having any legal say over anything which means that let's say that people, 10 people buy in for $285,000. So that's a lot of money that's now at the disposal of the community. But ultimately, the ones responsible for that money and what happens to it are these two named organisational representatives who are in the Nightcap documentary. Dean Rodimer, who's the Aboriginal artist, goes into Nimbin and brings back the um, woofers to the community. And uh, I've met Dean a couple of times. I actually even said to my daughter a couple of weeks ago, I said, wow, well, you wouldn't know what Dean's doing now. I said, you remember Dean, don't you? And she said, yeah, that fat drunk. And it was like, oh, okay didn't think he was that fat and um, well as far as drunk I mean I, d I don't 
you know, I try not to see people in that category, but hey, they were her words, not mine. And Mark Cora, um, yeah, well, he kind of reminds me of someone that I, um, <laughs> I won't name. But uh, these two people are tribal people, Aboriginals, that uh, hold millions of dollars in their hands. Now, when I was working at the NT News in Darwin, oh, back in the last uh, millennia, before the change of the century, I um, actually had dealings with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Commission investment commissions who were dealing with the um, all native title most of the mines are on native title so the mines have to pay money to the Aboriginal communities for uh, being on that land and operating and the payment of those funds goes in to um, something like the Abor Aboriginal Torres Strait Island Fund. And the thing is that over so many times they had had, um, they had appointed different people to try and look after the funds and every time they did, they completely got demolished. I mean, we are talking about millions and millions of dollars in royalties from mine site leases and you have to consider that most of the mine sites in Australia are on native title claims they are paying royalties to native claimants and that does actually push up the price of the actual production of everything to begin with now, I'm not going to get into the whole mining industry and how I feel about that because um, I, I was involved with it for probably at least 20 years. Not directly, but in a way, direct, very directly. Um, a lot of experiences in the mining fields, put it that way. More than I wanted to know, but uh, I did it to try and help out. So... Ultimately, I'm, I'm just going to try and finish this up now because I've probably been yakking for ages. Um, this nightcap community that's set up at the very core of the pyramid with the... Oh, that's, that's big. With the member discretionary fund that ultimately that's the whole controlling mechanism for what happens on the outside and also what you see on the outside. You will never know what these people are directing because they are hidden behind something that can't be seen. So this is where you have to start making um, the connections between, all right, so now that they've acquired the final parcel of land or reacquired it they can move ahead with the development and they've started offering you know really let's sell this now and that's how max egan has earned his way into the community two hundred and eighty five thousand dollars so even if he was getting twenty thousand you know maybe they might have offered him fifty thousand or Maybe they offered him less or maybe they just didn't put a dollar value on it and said, hey, if you can get 20 people to buy in, yeah, you've got your own place. Whatever the contract, verbal contract was with them, he's succeeded and he's been rewarded. You can say that's an assumption. Well... Tell me, how else did he come up with $285,000? I'm sure the tax office would like to know too, considering that he is actually getting income that would not have been taxed and he's presenting as a fake person, which would then make that an attempt to defraud. I mean, there's a whole lot of ways you can explain all of this, but seriously... You know, I'm going to try and get my um, cousin involved in this and uh, take it to the next level. Because it's not good enough for me to be constantly doing these YouTubes and trying to warn people. You know, I'm done with it. I've pretty much got 
I mean, the the boring details of how it all goes together, I don't think people want to know. I just want to show people that I've looked into it enough to know that there are warning signs. I mean, how the hell does Wollumbin Horizons reacquire um, land when it's went into receivership in 2018? And when you go into receivership, it's handled by external administration. They would not have said, here, buy the land and... Well, I don't know. It, it seems like buying and selling to the same people to me. I don't understand. I'd have to, and this is why I say I really need to find out because there's too much of this, you know, they said there was no connection in the court document between Wollumbin Horizons, Mount Eco Warning Village. Of course there is. Mark Darwin made that association in the uh, Bulla Bulla and draw, drew all of them together as the same thing. And that video evidence was not available to the court. And neither is current evidence that has been done after that, even the videos and admissions of people involved with it. I mean, priceless admissions. Offering back someone money that you never took money from in the first place, that's a red flag. Five times in open court, when open court is to seek remedy, they would have ta insisted she take it the first time. You know, there's an old saying, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, sounds like a duck, guess what? It's probably a duck. Yeah, I've got lots of sayings. I was raised in in schools that had in the back of the English book a whole list of common sayings you had to learn to understand, to bring the greater meanings of proverbs into understanding so that, you know, you can say something short and sweet with a saying. And I haven't kept this short and sweet, but I'm going to end it short and sweet right here and say, catch you next time.